So far in our discussion on enzymes, we focused on two types of enzymes. We discussed proteases and carbonic anhydrases. Now we're going to focus on a third type of enzyme found in our body known as nucleoside monophosphate kinases or simply NMP kinases. Now, NMP kinases catalyze the transfer of a phosphoryl group from some type of nucleoside triphosphate, for example, ATP molecule, onto another molecule, namely the nucleoside monophosphate, or NMP. And to, this, and to basically show what that means, let's take a look at the following general chemical equation. So, we have two reactants, two substrate molecules, and this reaction is catalyzed by some type of NMP kinase. Now, in this particular case, because I'm using ATP as a specific nucleoside triphosphate, the name of the NMP kinase molecule is adenylate kinase. And so, adenylate kinase will catalyze the transfer of this purple terminal phosphoryl group from the ATP molecule onto this region of the nucleoside monophosphate. And we ultimately form the nucleoside diphosphate and the adenosine diphosphate. So this loses a phosphoryl group and this gains a phosphoryl group. So in this reaction, we have two substrate molecules, the ATP as well as the NMP. Now, what do we have to know about nucleoside monopho monophosphate kinases? Well, there are three things that you have to keep in mind about these enzymes. And let's begin by discussing the first one. So, NMP kinase molecules, for example, adenylate kinase or guanylate kinase. So, guanylate kinase basically catalyzes the transfer of the phosphoryl group from GTP onto some type of NMP. So, if we study the three-dimensional structure of all these different types of NMP kinases, for example, these two, we're going to see a region that is conserved. It remains the same when we go from one molecule, one enzyme, one kinase, to another kinase. And this is the region shown here. So if we begin at the beginning of the polypeptide chain, this is where we're going to be. And so we basically move along the polypeptide chain, and this is the first beta sheet that we come across. And then we continue moving and we move through this colored loop. And this colored loop is known as the P-loop structure. And we'll see why we call it the P-loop in just a moment. Then we have the first alpha helix, and then we continue. We have the second beta sheets, then we continue. We have the second alpha helix, we continue. We have the third beta sheet and so forth. And we continue all the way until we get to the end. Now, what's so special about this colored loop? Well, this loop is known as the P-loop. And the reason we call it the P-loop is because this polypeptide section is the section that contains the amino acids that are responsible for actually binding to and interacting with the ATP molecule. And more specifically, it will interact with the negative charges on this triphosphate group of that ATP molecule. And if we study the sequence of nucleotides among the different types of NMP kinases on that P loop, this is what we're going to see. So it's relatively conserved. So we have a glycine followed, uh, followed by four X's, where the X basically describes some type of arbitrary amino acid, and then we have glycine and lysine. Now, what we see happen is, the NH groups that are basically found on the backbone of this P loop will interact, will form hydrogen bonds with the negative charges of these oxygen on the triphosphate. And, like, and likewise, if we have any residue that contains a positive charge, so if we have basic residues such as lysine and arginine found on a P loop, those will also form interactions with this triphosphate. And so it's the P loop structure found inside this domain of the enzyme that actually is responsible for binding and interacting with this substrate molecule, the triphosphate group of that particular nucleoside triphosphate. So in the case of adenylate kinase, it's the triphosphate group of the ATP that the P loop actually interacts with. 
Now, the second thing you have to know about nucleoside monophosphate kinases is they use a specific mechanism of enzyme catalysis known as metal ion catalysis. Now, we actually discussed metal ion catalysis previously when we discussed proteases and carbonic anhydrases. But the major difference between that type of metal ion catalysis and the metal ion catalysis that takes place within NMP kinases is here that metal ion doesn't actually interact with the active site's enzyme, but it interacts with the substrate molecule itself. So we see that NMP kinases require the presence of a metal atom such as magnesium or a manganese. And so we have to have some type of divalent metal atom. Divalent simply means it has a charge of positive two. So to demonstrate why this is so, let's suppose we have the ATP molecule as our substrate. So this is the ATP, so we have our adenine base, the sugar component, and the triphosphate group. And so the reason we need that magnesium or the manganese, the reason we need a divalent positive metal ion is because the positive metal ion will interact with the negative charges on the oxygen molecule, on the ox uh, oxygen atoms of the triphosphate, and by interacting with the oxygen, they will create a conformational change in that substrate molecule. And by inducing that conformational change, they will create a shape, they will give the ATP molecule a shape that is appropriate for the shape of that active site. So we need the divalent metal atom to basically give the ATP substrate molecule the appropriate shape so that it can actually enter and bind to the active site of that nucleoside monophosphate kinase. So before the NTP substrate in this particular ATP, in this particular case ATP, can bind onto the active side of that kinase, the NTP must bind to a divalent metal atom such as magnesium or manganese. So what happens is two oxygens on this triphosphate interact with our magnesium atom. So we have the alpha oxygens, we have the beta oxygens, these two, and then we have these are the gamma oxygens because this is the alpha phosphorus atom, the beta phosphorus atom, and the gamma phosphorus atom. And so the magnesium can either interact with the alpha and beta oxygens or with the alpha and gamma oxygens or, as in this particular case, the beta and gamma oxygens. And each time the magnesium interacts with two different oxygens, that creates its own unique, uh, its own unique conformation. And so different enzymes require a different interaction because different enzymes require a different shape. And in this particular case, for adenylate kinase, the magnesium must interact with these two oxygen atoms to give it the proper orientation and shape to basically be able to bind into the active side of that NMP kinase. Now, not only will the magnesium interact with two oxygen atoms of the triphosphate of the substrate, but the magnesium will also be stabilized by four different water molecules, and that will give a stabilizing octahedral arrangement. So these are the two oxygens that come from the triphosphate group, and these are the four oxygens. And so the partially negative oxygen of these water molecules will form bonds, coordinate bonds, with this magnesium atom. And this will stabilize that structure and create a conformational change that will basically bridge that active site structure and the structure of this particular substrate molecule. So the magnesium will interact with two oxygen atoms on the ATP molecule as well as four water molecules and the interaction will hold that substrate in a well-defined conformation, a well-defined shape that is suitable for the shape of the active side found in that enzyme. And so ultimately we see
that the metal ion serves as a bridge between the substrate molecule and the enzyme. Without that metal ion, the substrate would not be able to bind into the active site because it would not have the proper orientation. And so ultimately, it's the ATP metal ion complex that is the substrate of that active site because only when the metal atom binds with the ATP molecule will the interactions between the active site and the substrate be perfect and very stabilizing interactions. Now, the, uh, the final thing that I'd like to mention about NMP kinases is that they not only use the metal ion catalysis, but they also use catalysis by proximity and orientation. And to see what we mean by that, let's take a look at the structure of our NMP kinase, namely the adenylate kinase. And so this is the domain that we basically spoke of earlier, and this is our P loop. So what happens is, once the magnesium binds onto the ATP molecule, that creates a correct conformation, and then the ATP magnesium complex can move into the active side of this molecule and bind with that P-loop structure. And once it binds with the P-loop structure, that creates a localized change in conformation, and that localized chain creates a more extensive change in the entire structure of that particular enzyme. And in particular, if we examine the purple region, this is known as the lid domain of the kinase, as it binds onto the P-loop, this basically closes down just like a lid closes on top of a can. And so in the same way, this lid basically closes down and it induces a conformational change that traps that ATP molecule in the proper orientation so that now the other substrate, the NMP, can bind onto the active side and it binds in such a way so that the terminal phosphoryl group of the ATP is in close proximity and in the proper orientation with respect to this NMP molecule. And that's exactly why, what we mean by catalysis by proximity and orientation. What the active side does is it creates, it induces this change that brings these two substrate molecules in close proximity and arranges them in a proper orientation, which basically decreases the energy of transition and it basically catalyzes the transfer of this phosphoryl group from ATP onto the NMP. In addition, because these two substrate molecules are essentially trapped in the active side, nothing else can actually come in because this entire lid domain closes off. And so other molecules, for example, water molecules, will not be able to enter the active site, and that means the water molecules will not be able to hydrolyze this section. And so that will decrease the likelihood that any competing reaction will take place. Because remember, the problem is, if we don't have the NMP kinase and these two molecules are in the presence of water, water will be very likely to actually hydrolyze and break this bond here. And what that means is, instead of transferring the phosphoryl group onto the NMP, that phosphoryl group will be transferred onto the water molecule. And so what the enzyme does is it utilizes catalysis by proximity, it closes all of the active site and keeps away the water molecules and so no competing reactions can actually take place. So once again, as the ATP magnesium substrate binds to the P loop, as, it, as this complex binds onto this P loop here, it induces a local conformational change in the section and that causes a more extensive change. And so the lid domain essentially closes off. And then the binding of that second substrate, the NMP molecule, into the active site creates additional changes, and this causes catalysis by proximity. So these changes in conformation 
hold the two substrates close together, so in close proximity, and gives them the proper orientation that basically promotes the transfer of the phosphoryl group. So it decreases the energy of the transition state, decreases the activation energy barrier, and prevents any competing reactions from actually taking place. So NMP kinases do not only utilize the metal ion catalysis mechanism, but they also utilize catalysis by proximity and orientation.